Just jumping in here quickly to let you guys know that I have recently created a Facebook group uh, for listeners of the Live, Train, Perform podcast. So this private forum is the place to connect with other podcast listeners and guests, as well as to interact with myself and other uh, coaches who have provided content for the Coaches Corner episodes. So in this forum, you can ask questions, which I can then answer in the group, or I can use them uh, for episodes for my Q&A sessions, post relevant articles, you can share memes. Uh, The goal is to create a network of like-minded people um, so that everyone can interact with each other. Um, You guys, the listeners, the audience members can uh, interact with a network of professionals in the fitness industry uh, that have provided good quality content for the podcast To gain access to this private group, all you need to do is leave me a rating and review. What this does is allows me to bump up the ratings, uh, draw bigger names, uh, bigger guests to the podcast for your listening pleasure. Um, Once you've left a rating and review, take a screenshot of that, send that through to my uh, Instagram at coach underscore Cobes, K-O-B-E-S. Once you've done that, go onto Facebook, type in Live, Train, Perform. That group will come up, request access, answer the three questions, and I will grant you access. I am in the process of building out my online business. Uh, One of the income streams is going to be from the Facebook forum. Uh, So I'm going to be allowing 50 people into that forum for free. After that, uh, it will be paid access only. So get in early, be one of the OGs. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome back to the Live, Train, Perform podcast. I'm your host, Sean Cobra, and joining me again today is Rob Morgan for what is actually the fourth time, uh, but the software didn't record our last conversation correctly, so uh, technically, he's back for the third time. Welcome back, Rob. Thanks, mate. Yeah, a bit of a technical glitch last time, but uh, gives me another opportunity to come back on and uh, have a chat with you, mate. So it's all good. It's all practice, brother. It's all practice. That's it, man. You've got yourself a microphone and, and some and a headset as well. So yeah, I've, you're I've good, mate. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm turning pro. That's it, brother. Got to <laughs> got to upgrade, mate. Upgrade yeah. the software. Upgrade the hardware. Absolutely. You got a lot of content coming out as well. So um, I'm sure we'll discuss everything that you you've got going on at the moment. The content you're creating. Everything that's going on with your business. Um, but first of all, what I wanted to get you on the episode for, mate, is you've actually had a quite unique 18 months. You are typically based in Thailand, your business is there, your family's there, um, etc. That's where you call home. Uh, you actually went back to Australia last year with your wife um, to give birth to your first child. Not your first child, but well, your first child, but Jess gave yeah. birth. <laughs> Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um <laughs> Just getting through my first coffee now, mate. <laughs> um, and you actually got stuck in Australia. Uh, and there was a lot of things that kind of unfolded that was outside of your control. So that's pretty much why I wanted to get you on in today's episode was to, scu- to discuss that entire process, all of the challenges that you faced, but also the, the growth that you went through. Can you talk to my audience quickly about who you are, um, what you do, and then we'll go into what that journey looked like? Yeah, man. Well, firstly, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use the word kind of stuck in, in, in quite a loose context because, um, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there's a, there's a lot of worse places to be stuck, um, than Australia. But yeah, it wasn't, wasn't what we had planned, wasn't kind of what we were, um, expecting. And we kind of had, you know, the control of our movement taken out of our hands. So technically, yeah, we, we were stuck, um, in the safe situation that we were in. So, um, I had lived in, lived and worked in Thailand for about, six years i think um prior to leaving so we had decided um, my wife and i jess who's from australia we had decided um that we wanted to to give birth to our first child in australia uh just for a few reasons number one is is, is the healthcare um that is there and, and number two to avoid any future complications when it came came to like you know place of birth and birth certificates and all, all that kind of stuff so mm-hmm. we made the decision to go back um, at the start of 2020, uh, I left uh, Thailand in February. My wife actually left a month before me, but I had some—I actually had some visa issues getting into Australia uh, due to some things that had gone on with me in in the past. So my wife had actually travelled without me. Being a naughty boy, mate. Being a little bit of a naughty boy, yeah, which I think we spoke <laughs> about on on the first first time I come on the pod, right? Yeah. Um, so all, all that stuff is still still haunting me to this day. Mm. Um, but but we got through it, which meant that Jess had to leave Thailand before me because she was coming up to the seven month point, which is like the latest time that that you can fly. So 
I was then, you know, fingers crossed, trying to get out of Phuket so then we could go back and, and, and be together for the birth. So I got out of Phuket like the last week of February, uh, which was awesome. And then the, of course, there was there was things going on during that period with with COVID in China and things were starting to sort of escalate there. But there was there was no sign of it in you know in in. Australia or in the UK and we had no foresight or no idea of, of what was about to happen in terms of you know the whole world locking down so mm. I just about managed to get in there and then the whole world locked down about two or three weeks later I think so during that time um, then obviously we we had to deal with having uh, having our first child uh, during the lockdown all the restrictions and stuff that were in place not being able to get out you know not having to have people come around the house to, to see the baby, the restrictions in the hospital, you know, certain times that we're allowed to spend in there and, and all that kind of stuff essentially kind of added to added to the stress of, of giving birth to your first child, which is, you know, it's enough of a, of a challenge as it is. Um, but we got through it. We got through it well. Um, and then we were faced with, you know, looking at what was next because the initial plan was for us to get some uh, vaccinated, get the passport, get all the paperwork sorted, and then we'd be back in Phuket. We had plans in place. I had, um, you know, fitness escapes uh, planned in to, to run for the for the remainder of the year, um, which was my my business. Um, but due to the lockdowns, Thailand, uh, sorry, Australia closes borders to people leaving. Thailand closes borders to people coming in. So there's pretty much no way, uh, no way that we could get back, and we didn't know how long that was going to persist so we've we've had a new baby uh we were in temporary accommodation we're staying in an airbnb which was you know due to expire so having to do all the logistics and think what what was the best thing for us uh, we decided to hold tight in australia extended our stay by another three months and thought you know we'll, we'll wait to see what happens so essentially we're living in this space where we're constantly Waiting uh, for things to for things to happen and to see what's going to transpire. Of course, we were in a pretty good place. Uh, being in Australia, the way that they closed the borders down and and basically eradicated uh, the virus, so that we wouldn't we didn't really have to deal with with that per se. Um, but then it was all the the uncertainty that there was the biggest thing for us. So we were essentially living month by month, uh, which continued for. Uh, well, a year. So we were pretty much living month by month, just extending Airbnbs. We did a little bit of travel. We thought, you know, we'll, we'll take this time to, we, we were in South Australia down in Adelaide. We thought we'll take this time to go across to Queensland, see what life's like over there. Went up to Noosa, down to the Gold Coast. Uh, so, the, the, you know, a little bit more of a kind of tropical, better climate, uh, the vibe mm-hmm. that we were kind of used to. So, there was there were some positives out of it, but again, you know, it it was the unknown, not knowing when we were going to be able to number one come home, home, which is you know to Thailand, which is what we classed as home, and also when we were going to be able to introduce Summer to her grandparents because one of her grandparents is in Phuket and, one, and two of her grandparents and the rest of my family were were back in Wales, so they actually mm-hmm. had to wait uh, sixteen months to to meet us, uh, which was obviously a bit of a, a kicker for my, for my parents. Um, so mm, sure. we, we kind of went through the whole process of deciding, you know, what we wanted to do and, and all the rest of it, um, and and kind of through all the uncertainty, um, eventually managed to to get back to the UK. Um, yeah, when summer was sixteen months, so we've pretty much been in Australia for for all that time uh, with a lot of uncertainties and a lot of unknowns. So you know, for to have a first child. And not have a bedroom, not have a nursery set up, not have all the clothes and all the the, the typical stuff that you would normally take for granted, right? So, mm. or even just that. being in your own home environment, man. Like that's such a big one, being in your own environment. You were living out of a suitcase for pretty much that entire time, weren't you? Pretty much, yeah. Myself and Jess had twenty kilos each, and and some had ten. So anytime wow. we, we travelled or we kind of got on a flight, um, you know, we had to make sure that. We could pack everything in, in into into what we had. The thought of you know uh, prams or cribs or you know cots, whatever whatever you want to call it, all that kind of stuff, car seats. Because um, because mm-hmm. not only are we you know we're with with the Airbnb factor, like if we'd have known that we would have been there for a year, we would have took out a, a long term rental, right? 
But of given course. the fact that we were kind of living month by month to wait and see what happened, it was it was very temporary. So often we had to move at kind of short notice when bookings came up in, in the Airbnb. So within the first twelve months, some had actually lived in 10, 10 different houses in the first in the first twelve months. Um, wow. And then you know we decided should should we actually apply for for a long term rental to give us some sort of stability. But the, the market in Australia at the time was just wild with, with rentals because there were so many people uh, there that couldn't travel and people that had lived overseas that had returned. The population had kind of mm. grown. So there were so many people looking for, uh, for, for rentals. So the rental market was like, you know, saturated. And not only that, you know, my, my wife had just given birth, so I was technically unemployed. Um, and I'm that my business is here in, in Thailand, so I've got no proof of income. I've, I've got no um, mm. credit history, none of that stuff. So we, we wouldn't even have been able to get a rental uh, if we tried. So I was just trying to make the best of the, of the situation and always, always having uh, a backup plan. You know, ideally, this is how things are going to look. But, you know, if this doesn't happen, um, how, you know, what, what's plan B? What, what's the alternative? So pretty much living mm. like that for the, for the, for the whole period. Yeah, that's pretty wild, man. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask, like, what were the pros and the cons of that experience? The, the probably the biggest pro to me was the amount of time I actually got to spend spend with um, Summer and Jess during that time. So, for the first, well, even even up until very recently, pretty much every day, you know, every meal, every every pretty much. Every day, the whole day, I was pretty much spending with with summer. So I was kind of at home, present. You know, I, I could I could be there to help Jess. I could be there to take the pressure off. We kind of worked together as a team and get to spend that much time with her during her first year, during the first eighteen months. Which you know, ninety percent of men don't have that mm. have that luxury. So that, that's a mm. huge plus for me. I got to witness. All her, all of her development, her first steps, her first words, the first time she rolled over, all these kind of things that a lot of times dads don't, don't get to experience. So for me, um, the, yeah, there was a, there was a lot of, lot of positives there. Um, spending time, spending time with Jess as well and just becoming a unit. And, you know, looking back on it, it probably, it, it probably worked out perfectly because you know we, we just got on with things at the end of the day if if, if we'd have been in a different time in a different situation then things could have turned down uh, turned out a lot worse probably one of the yeah. one of the downsides I, I love that perspective mate sorry to interrupt there i love that perspective man and as you were saying that <clears throat> i was actually thinking because you know my ex-girlfriend we spent a lot of time together we'd only been together for a couple of months and then went traveling around the world and you know we we're living in each other's pockets all the time, man. And that actually strengthened the relationship. And I was just thinking, whilst you're speaking then, I wonder how many relationships kind of went down the drain through that lockdown period because people hadn't actually spent that much time together. And then yeah. all of a sudden, they're with their partners all the time and they like realize, well, I don't like it when you do this and I don't like it when you do that. And all these little things start coming out, man. Yeah, that's true. I've I've actually heard uh, quite a few instances where that's happened. It's like, mm. you know, they're, they're pretty much people are living almost separate lives and then coming together mm-hmm. to spend a couple of hours together in the evenings or the weekends. But when you put them in, in that same, same room together for 24 hours, you know, you've got to find stuff that you've got in common. You've got to find mm. you know, common values, common grounds, people's habits, you know, again, just doing little things that might get on, on somebody's nerves. It's all magnified when you're in, in that situation, a lot, lot harder to deal with. Throw in, a, throw in a newborn baby, keeping you up all night oh. as well, and, and that only adds to the stress <laughs> as well. All that stress is just being amplified. Yeah. Yeah, cool. What, what about some of the negatives that you face there? Obviously, the uncertainty is going to be a big one. Yeah, the, the uncertainty was um, the, the biggest thing. Um, obviously, not... For me, with work, I had to completely kind of pivot and, and change um, the way I, I was operating. So obviously not being able to get back to Thailand where uh, a lot of my clients are and, and the, you know, was the location for the, for, the, for the fitness escapes, which essentially you know, pretty much had to disappear overnight. So then it's, it's transitioning more um, and, and, and creating uh, an on, online platform. So having to do that straight away is like, now I, you know, I need to find, I, I pretty much 
had a had a pot, so obviously I, we we knew what was going to happen. I knew I, I'd, I'd saved up and I had you know a certain amount of money to last me a certain amount of period. But now you know I need to I need to bring some money in because it, it's not it's not cheap living in Australia. Um, you know, especially when you've got family to support and, and all the rest of it. So having to having to kind of pivot, uh, transition the business, and, and find new ways to to generate an income um, was obviously again again a negative or, or maybe a con, but. On the flip side, again, it's turned into a positive because now I've completely changed the way um, my, my business model is and it's allowed to give me essentially more, more freedom and it's allowed me to, uh, to, to serve and, and to help more people and, and to, to expand my, my reach through the, the online system, which is not now my pretty, pretty much my primary, uh, my primary business. Mm, I love that. Can you just tell my audience what your uh, business looked like before and then how you had to transition and what it currently looks like now. Okay, yeah, so um, I used to run a fitness escape here in, in Phuket, um, which is essentially, you know, 100% relied on fitness tourism. So people flying in from from all over the world to undertake um, a, a transformational uh, training program, whether that was, um, you know, for for body, for mind, or whatever people would, were kind of dealing with, just to kind of give them that transformational ex- experience here in, in, in a tropical paradise. Um, so, yeah, 100%. Where kind of everything was taken care of, where they pretty much come in, it's like a, it's kind of like a resort style where you're running workshops on different components, it might be mindset, nutrition, goal setting, etc., etc. Meals are taken care of, they're living in a tropical villa, they've got a nice pool, everything's sorted for them, their stress levels are low, they don't have to worry about too much, they just need to be somewhere at a specific time to go through the program, right? Exactly, yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, alongside that, um, in the in the down times when, when I wasn't running uh, the escapes, um, I, ha- I had some clients here in, in Phuket that I kind of worked with one-on-one, um, and then I had the online platform, the online offering. I'd had it for a number of years due to the amount of people I've worked with that had been here to Phuket um, and, and, and that needed something additional to give them that support and guidance when they went back to, to wherever they, they, they went. But that was probably, you know, 10 to 20 percent of my, my, my time and, and, and effort went into that probably. 60 to 70 percent into the the resort uh, sorry the, the the escape and then the, the rest of it was the the one-to-ones so mm-hmm. when i then went to australia you know i pretty much had to had to convert that to be 100 percent reliant on on the online uh, online business mm. yeah for sure man and i i had a very similar story you know when I, I i first started my online coaching business probably like five or six years ago now and when i first moved to thailand the goal was to um, you know, I was going to work at Tiger, had a two month intern contract where I was working for free. And I was like, well, if I can make enough money via my online coaching to be able to live into Th- live in Thailand and live it like a decent life without tapping into my savings, then I'm good to go, you know? So, um, that was going to be the goal. If I didn't get a job at Tiger, if I didn't get a job in Thailand, the plan was to, you know, go and travel the world for like six months and then maybe base myself in New Zealand or somewhere and really start pushing and building that online platform. Um, as it turns out, I got offered a job, ended up becoming head coach at Tiger. I didn't need to go down that route, but I've always had that online coaching platform there. And over the years, you know, as you said, it's like five, ten percent for me. So I never push it, I never advertise it. You know, I've never got any more than probably like ten to twelve clients on there at one time because, you know, I don't want to have too many people, quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, and it's not my primary focus. So I was, I was the same as you, mate. Like once um, the pandemic hit, then I was like, all right, I'm going to start pushing this out a little bit more and, you know, use this as my primary source of income. But the point that I'm making is like that was an investment that I made many years earlier. I'd already had the the skeleton in place, the frameworks in place. And then once I got to a point where I was like, oh, fuck, I've got no income coming in. I don't know what the situation is. I don't know when I'm going to go back to work and when I'm going to start getting paid again then I could really start building that platform out. Um, I think that's a really important um, component of life, mate, is is having a look at different um, income streams and different platforms that can allow you, you know, you're mitigating risks ahead yeah. of time, right? Like if something happens, you know, no one expected the pandemic to hit, no one expected to, you know, be sitting where we are right now. 
after roughly 18 months of what's happened in the world but at the end of the day like you know you've got to prepare for the future you've always got to have things um, up your sleeve in case something does happen that's out of out of your control yeah yeah it's diversifying right so you've got different options um, and, and also just having that um, that ability because essentially you know we're doing the same thing in just a different means whether it's mm-hmm. one-to-one whether it's online whether it's in a group environment you know whatever it is but as, as, as coaches as fitness coaches or health coaches it's just finding the best method of delivering the solution to to the people that we're, we're trying to help mm. Yeah, for sure. Now let's let's discuss that for a moment because what I've found with my online coaching is it's it's like you said it's it's kind of similar, but it's also completely different, man. You know, when I'm coaching people one on one, it's all about the training. It's all about their movement quality. It's all about structural integrity, building strength, power, blah, blah whatever the, whatever we're working on, whatever the the phase of. Uh, sorry, the goal of that phase is, you know, and then we'll discuss nutrition a little bit, we'll discuss mindset, we'll discuss goal setting, lifestyle factors, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but that's not the primary conversation. I found once I'm, you know, once I started moving online and with my online clients in particular, the conversations revolve more around the mindset and the goal setting and the consistency and building habits and um, that type of stuff. And the training side of things is, Sometimes I don't even talk about the training side of things, mate. And yeah. like, you know, every single client call is different and it's I'm pretty much taking the clients where they need to go and I'm meeting them where they are because I'm not actually physically training them. Yeah. I can't see them move, right? Like they'll send me some videos every now and again. Hey, can you check out my form on this exercise, blah, 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 and I'll give them some tweaks and adjustments and things like that. But, you know, for the most part, the conversations are completely different with my online clients than they are with my my face-to-face clients. Do you have... Or do you experience anything like that or something similar? Or? Yeah, b- very similar. I mean, when we're working with people one to one, they're, they're essentially, you know, they're essentially paying for us for, for that hour or however long it is of our time. So we've got that limited um, sort of time period to work with them and all the other clients that we're working as well. So um, it then it becomes about the training, the movement, you know, what, what ac- we're actually doing in the session. And we can't really give them too much assistance with everything outside of that. So that's, you know, could it, it could be three hours a week or four hours a week, five hours a week, however long it is. The un- other 163 hours of the week, they're kind of on their own. Of course, if you're a one-to-one coach, you would love to be able to assist them with that. But at the end of the day, you're working with multiple different clients. So you don't have the time, you don't have the energy to be checking in with people to see how they're going with the nutrition and their sleep and all these types of things. So the 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 much bigger benefit of having the online system is it, it gives us the time and, and energy to be able to do with that to do that right so to check in with them so the the, the training is just one element of the program then it becomes a lot more about like you said their lifestyle habits what they're dealing with day to day it's not so much that we're there to make sure that they've done you know five reps of 80 kilos it's it's okay <laughs> what obstacle are you facing today that's going to stop you from getting into the gym how are you, how's the body feeling what have you got going on with your family what's going on with work what's currently preventing you from from getting to where you want to be and it, it, it's helping them and, and that's typically what what people need help with and, and just being able to give them that support system um, and the guidance and the accountability because you know oft, often they're not getting into the gym and, and getting through the session, you know, the, the main thing is the adherence and the consistency, mm-hmm. you know, specifically what they're doing. Of course, it is important, but on the grand scheme of things, it's not as important as getting into the gym for, for those set targets of however many times that we decide each week. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, I want to talk about what you're doing with your business now. So, Obviously, we've just gone through the last 18 months. You've actually now um, returned back to Phuket and you've been settled there. You've got your family there. Um, you're, you're building your home. Um, I saw you fitted out your home gym recently. Yep. Um, let's discuss how your business has transitioned from the online stuff back to being in your home location. Like, How's your business going to look uh, moving forward? Yeah, what are you working so, on? Um, 
I mean, obviously, being back in Phuket, we were like thrilled to be back. We've been back, you know, almost two months, so so good to be back. Living uh, living the island life is is really where we feel at home, and it's a it's a really good place. We feel um, for summer to spend the, this early part of of her life, however long it will end up being for. Um, so so great to be back, and great to be able to kind of properly get get set up because doing all that travel, you know, it's very difficult to to uh, deliver uh, a high enough quality service or the, the quality of service that I know that I'm capable of doing when I don't know where I'm going to be from, from week to week. I don't know what gym I'm going to be at. I don't know what, you know, what content I rec- record and, and, and where I'm going to be doing my calls and, and all this type of thing. So just being back, being able to get set up um, where I'm at. So I'm, I'm going to maintain the online platform as, as my primary um, primary business and, and the primary the way I'm gonna gonna basically serve people. I have started back with um, a couple of clients here on the island, but I'm gonna keep that sort of limited because I do enjoy working one to one with people. At the end of the day, I love I love that um, you know. That's why we got into the business, bro. Exactly, you know, just dealing with people, having the banter, like working with people one on one and and seeing for yourself. The progress they can make, you know, nothing can replace that. So I will keep an element mm-hmm. of that. So I'm working. Actually, I've, I've picked up a few more clients than, than I'd anticipated um, at, at the <laughs> moment. But um, yeah, just trying to maintain the online um, business as, as as the main platform, um, and just being able to now spend the time really building out the best solution that I can in terms of giving the clients the the best quality. So having you know. There's a few reasons why I've I've built the gym uh, here outside. Number one, it's it's, it's personal, right? I've I've got a uh, got a young child and my wife at, at home, so I want to spend as much time with them as I can, which is something I've learned over over the last eighteen months. So I can literally roll out of bed and I'm pretty much in the gym. And I've got everything there that I need. So mm-hmm. it just saves time. It saves the commute. It saves you know the kind of the, the chit chat that you typically have with people. That all kind of takes. Uh, takes time out of your day waiting around for for equipment and, and that type of thing so save me a little bit of time there i have the gym no matter what's going on i know that i'm going to be able to get out to the gym get get a good workout in and, and i always make that my kind of priority for the day and then number two is it just gives me um a, a solution to be able to to create content that's gonna that's gonna help my 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 clients right so recording video demonstrations explanations and, and just Having uh, having an area, having a dedicated space that I can basically get into my get my creative juices flowing when I'm coming up with new programs and new routines and new exercises and, and all that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, nice. I love that. I want to talk about how your training has changed in the last or over the last two years. I'm assuming you've gone through like different phases, different periods of training. Obviously, before the pandemic <clears throat> kicked off. Before you left for Australia, you're probably training out of a gym and then, you know, you're in lockdown, you're in an Airbnb with little to no equipment uh, and now you're back home uh, with your own gym set up. So talk to me and my audience about how your training has changed over the last two years. Yeah, so when when I left Phuket, I was actually training over at um, Tiger Beachside, the, the the flashy new um, the flashy new facility that they built over there. And at the time, it was um, you know they they were just starting to, to to pick things up there and, and get some classes running and stuff like that. But the reason um, that I went over there is because it pretty much had everything that I needed um, and was was pretty quiet at the time as well. So. Everything that you can imagine that you need in a gym was there. You know, you're, you're the head coach there at Tiger. So I imagine you had a lot of input into, into, into designing and, and creating that. So I fitted know, that whole thing out, mate. Yeah. So, you know, you've got the whole rig. You've got as much weight as you could ever need. You've got the prowler track. You've got the skier. You've got the assault bike. You've got the concept two rowers. You pretty much got everything, right? So pretty much, um, spoiled for choice there in, in being able to, to, to do what I wanted. So having a good, having a good mix of being able to put some good workouts together, um, in, in a really good space. And what I love more than anything is just having a space where you can just get your top off and just get down and get dirty and, and hit it hard. <laughs> so that's pretty much where I was, um, before I left, uh, Phuket. Then obviously getting to Australia, I had, um, I think I maybe had one or two weeks in like a, uh, anytime fitness kind of global style gym. Uh, and then lockdown hit. So 
I think in total it was probably four months there that the gyms were closed. So um, I'd had my, 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 my little home or my little travel uh, gym kit that I always carry everywhere I go, which is all it is, is essentially um, a set of resistance bands uh, and a skipping rope and, and a few massage balls. So that's pretty much all I had for, for that duration. I was training at home in the house uh, with with my wife and, and baby at home as well. So just, you know, when, when, when the newborn was asleep and Jess was napping and I was using that time to kind of try and try and squeeze a workout in, obviously it looked a lot different to how it did previously, but it was just finding something that was effective. And, and to be honest, just using those basic things, a good variety of resistance bands and my own body, you know, your own body is always going to be the most of a piece, most important piece of equipment you'll ever own. Um, being able to to, to maintain and, and and to create some some really good some really good workouts. So during that period, it, it didn't really impact me because again, I was at home. I didn't have to go out to the gym. The gyms were closed anyway. I actually started to introduce a lot more um, cardio. So I went out on you know started walking a lot more. So as soon as Summer was born, getting her out in the pram. You know, 5K, 10K, 12K walks along along some of the stunning coastline that, that's there in Australia. Um, so just getting the activity up that way and then and, and just running more, uh, swimming more. I started getting some swimming lessons once the once the, um, the swimming pools actually started opening back up. So completely changed um, from, from what it was, not lifting, you know, as heavy, maybe not training quite as intensely um, because also my... my, my my lifestyle was impacted, right? I wasn't sleeping as well as what I would have before. Mm -hmm. um, my, my routine was, was completely different to how it was before we left, before we, we had a baby. So I did have to make a lot of adjustments there during that period. Um, and during that period as well, you know, a lot of the clients that I was working with, it was the same thing for them. Clients that I had in the UK and, and Europe, you know, unfortunately for them, the gyms were closed for pretty much, I think, a year, maybe maybe even longer. So that just became the norm for them, creating a dedicated workout space at home, getting some resistance bands, maybe getting a few sets of dumbbells and a kettlebell if you can, um, but if not, just making do with, with what you can. So that's what I was doing, and then that's what I was, you know, helping my clients with, and, you know, they were getting results. You don't need all the equipment, all the flash equipment in, in the world to get results. You just need consistency and you need to get down and, and do some work. Yeah, 100%, man. Did your training times change? Like, you know, when you're at the gym, were you at the gym for an hour, hour 15, hour 30? And then when you're training at home, that training time reduced or was it still, were you still hitting the same frequency? No, no. And volume? So t typically before I would spend probably an hour and a half at the gym, I would spend maybe 15 to 20 minutes uh, doing some mobility work, warming up. Then I would typically spend maybe uh, about an hour, sometimes more, depending on what the, the phase was um, mm -hmm. on, on the workout itself, having a little bit of a cool down, a little bit of a stretch and maybe some, some breathing afterwards. So probably about an hour and a half. Then lockdown, um, probably 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. Um, I was doing a little bit more um, mobility throughout the day just because I had a little bit more time on my hands I was at home you know I got hold of a foam roller I had some things there so uh, <laughs> like be, being a new dad I did find that myself having a few aches and pains that I wasn't used to just from some of my um, habits that I'd picked up in terms of uh, holding some other way held that I was getting kind of um, over engaged in, in this this uh, left upper trap then from sleeping, because we didn't have a spare room, we didn't have a cot, we had summer in our bed, so I completely changed the way that I was sleeping. Wasn't being able to sleep on my back anymore because I was kind of having to make sure that I didn't roll over on, onto the baby. So I was doing a lot more lot more mobility work. Um, started seeing a physio as well, quite regularly as well during that period because I was, I was really feeling it um, with the body and obviously not being able to train to, to the level um, that I was, I was used to training. Obviously, that stuff all helps strengthen um, your structure and, and it helps you avoid any imbalances, right? But I wasn't able to do that with, with what I had available. So the training time shortened. I was probably training for about 30 or 40 minutes, but also doing slightly, slightly different things as well. And like I said, getting out, 
walking. I never walked so much. I, I literally got through a pair of trainers in about two months. I had to buy a new pair of trainers. The, <laughs> the, tread, was, the tread was gone, like no joke. Burnt the bottoms off, bro. Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, you made a, a couple of really good points there that I want to go back and touch on um, and provide a little bit of input for the listeners as well. You know, you spoke about having some at-home equipment there. You had a kettlebell, some bands. Oh, not a kettlebell, sorry. You had some bands, skipping rope, um, lacrosse balls, etc. cetera. Um, I'm the same, man. Like when I got out of the Army 2012, went traveled around the world for like six, seven months, 2013. I was like, right, I need, a, I need to put together a little mini gym that I can carry with me, a little travel gym. And I had um, a set of gymnastics rings. I had a skipping rope. I had uh, a band and a lacrosse ball and that was it man and I could do everything that I wanted with that and over the years like I've added um, another band um, and a set of glide boards as well um, yeah. and you know you can swap out uh, uh, gymnastics rings for TR- TRX or something like that um, some sort of suspension trainer but you know you can literally do so many things with very very limited equipment it's just understanding movement patterns and I actually put together uh, a heap of training plans or a heap of training sessions through the pandemic last year. I was, you know, recording three of my sessions every week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, Monday would be like a strength session and week one was just body weight strength where we're slowing the movements down, creating mind muscle connection, creating full body tension, but also intramuscular tension for the target muscles that we're working, working through primal movement patterns. Then Wednesday would have been a stability session, body weight, and then Friday was a, a conditioning session, body weight, and then the next week was kettlebell strength Monday, stability Wednesday, and then conditioning Friday, and then the next week was bands, and next week was suspension training, whatever. So, you know, I've got a heap of content up on my YouTube channel, performance functional training, but were you recording? I know you, I saw a heap of your posts where you're doing like body weight rows on the table and things like that. Were you, like, how were you structuring your training during that period? Yeah, so pr- pretty much um, trying trying to be resourceful, right? So uh, I think that, that one that you mentioned there, just trying to find, you know, a, a way of replicating poly movement. So you said about, um, you know, movement patterns, breaking the movement patterns down. Okay, we don't have a barbell, a kettlebell, dumbbells and all, all that stuff available, but we do have our own body. We do have things around the house as well. Okay. So trying to make use of what we have, have around the house, trying, trying to be, uh, resourceful. The style of training kind of changed a little bit more when you've only got your body weight and you've only got some bands. You do need to find a way of trying to kind of increase the intensity. So it, it, it kind of typically tended to be a little bit higher volume. Um, mm-hmm. so a lot of, lot of kind of giant sets, back to back, um, exercises, you know, cause we didn't have the opportunity to, to create too much progressive overload that you, you, you typically would. So again, yeah, creating the variety of, of just body weight, improving your movement, using your body weight through using slower time under tension, owning, owning the movements, really taking the time to perfect movements because again it's like okay mm-hmm. that's a we, big one we can't get in the gym but we can use this time to, to to perfect the movement that we can with with our body um and then creating variety so typically i work on like a, a four week or you know I, I was working on a four week phase with variety each week in terms of what we were working with so very, very similar to what you, you've just said whether it was body weight whether it was um, bands with the giant sets or whether we we're trying to go a little bit more with some conditioning work, some, some metabolic conditioning and, and getting out again, you know, just doing a few more sort of plyometric things with the space that, that we've got available, jump in and, 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 and this type of thing. Mm. Something you spoke about there as well was uh, the duration of your workouts um, really reduced down. Um, that's something that I did as well. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go into how you put together your schedule when you went through that lockdown period, if you had a schedule. Um, but, you know, I <clears throat> started the podcast during that lockdown period. I was studying my anatomy and physiology. I was putting together content for YouTube. Like my people were like, dude, how is your, you know, how have you been affected by lockdown? I was like, I haven't, you know, like the only thing is I don't have to leave my house to go to work. Yeah. I still, I was, dude, I was still getting up at six o'clock every morning 
and I would still go out and do my morning routine on my balcony and like watch the sunrise, do my meditation, have my coffee, do some reading. And then I'd be in like doing some study and then I'd start recording podcast content, blah, 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 blah. Like, and then I'd do like a 20 minute block in the morning where I'd go and get some mobility work in because I just got, I just returned from Australia. I'd been back in Thailand for about 10 days before everything locked down and I did my yoga course and I was like, all right, I'm going to use this time to really, you know, when I was in the gym, yeah, I'd do some mobility before every training session, but it was just enough to um, improve my movement quality for that training session. But then once we went into lockdown, I was like, all right, I'm going to make this a priority. I'm going to really focus on the mobility stuff. I'm going to um, reinforce all of this information that I've just learned on this yoga course. And I'm going to do some mobility slash yoga every morning for 20 minutes. You know, so I do that and then I'll get back into and then I'll have some food and then I'll go back into my work, creating content, study, whatever it might be. Um, and then I'll go and do, you know, a 20 minute block of strength based work around, you know, mid early mid afternoon and then if I felt like it I'd do another 20 minute block of some conditioning some aerobic conditioning or some anaerobic conditioning in the afternoon so I was breaking up that one hour of training time over three 20 minute blocks but what I found was you know some days I'd get into a flow state and I would like record three podcast episodes for example one day so if I did my mobility work in the morning and then I got into a flow state and I was just like, create content, create content. I'm going to, I'm going to ride this wave, man. I'm fucking, my creative juices are flowing. I'm going to continue on this wave. Then I didn't do my strength work and I didn't do my conditioning work. Then I didn't feel bad about myself because I'd done my number one priority. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. I mean, very similar to that. Actually, I've got, um, I've got a couple of clients that are, they're pilots. So currently in the, the air industry, the aviation industry, um, it, it's obviously very difficult crossing borders and, and the pilots mm. are super restricted to, to their movement. So they're, they're pretty much in, in what, what they call a closed loop. So they'll, they'll land, uh, in, in a country and obviously they're not allowed out into the, into the wider world. So they're, they're literally, they're literally room to room. Um, and they spend a lot of time in isolation, a lot of time in quarantine. So I've done exactly the same thing. Rather than giving them one session to do in the day, I've given them actually, I've actually given them three. So you can break up 20 to 30 minute blocks to, you know, a little bit of mobility in the morning. First thing when you wake up, um, maybe after lunch or before lunch, depending on how you're feeling, a little bit of strength work and a little bit of conditioning at the end. So it's probably, it's probably an hour to an hour and a half of, of training, but rather hitting up that in one block and then saying, right, what am I going to do for the rest of the rest of the day? It's, it's setting those, those challenges to, to, um, to keep them occupied, right? Because it's a big thing. Number one, mm-hmm. what, looking after your, your physical health in that situation, but number two, your, your mental health as well. So having things to focus on and things to work on. So, okay, you know, now I'm in this room for 14 days. It's giving me time to work on my mobility, work on my movement. You know, like you, like you just said, to, to, to improve maybe it's like most of my mobility set, um, kind of routines that I, I give my clients as well. There's a lot of yoga stuff involved in that. Um, so just, again, just trying to find, trying to find positives in, in the negatives, um, and trying to think outside the box in terms of how we're going to break things down and, and, and deliver the program. Mm. Yeah. I love that, bro. Now I just spoke about, you know, my structure throughout my days and, you know, so many people are like, oh dude, you're so disciplined. And I was like, this is just how I live my life. <laughs> like this is just, this is the routine that I've created. Like, you know, so many people say that I'm disciplined, but at the end of the day, like my habits that I've built over many, many, many years make it seem like I'm disciplined. For me, that's the path of least resistance. Yeah. Like it's easy for me to get out of bed at six o'clock and like roll straight into my morning routine, make my bed, take my waking heart rate, my blood pressure, my um, heart rate variability. Then I go and brush my teeth with my left hand and then I go out onto, you know, open the blinds, walk out on the balcony, get some fresh air, do five minutes of meditation. Then I, you know, sit there and drink my coffee and like just watch the sunrise and let my, let my thoughts run free. And then I'll go through and read and blah, blah, blah. Like that's just become the path of least resistance. And, you know, yes, I am disciplined, but I've built the habit of discipline. I've conditioned myself to do the right thing, even when I don't feel like it over many, many, many years. So um, I want to ask you like what your routine looked like through that lockdown period, obviously, you know, living in Airbnbs, lots of uncertainty, got a, you know, now you've got a newborn child. Like how did your life change from being, you know, in your home environment, working on your business to then 
being in an unknown environment, just having a child, being in lockdown, living out of a suitcase. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my morning routine was very similar to yours, mate. Um, you know, just spending that first part of the day doing certain things that you're conditioned to do, that it's actually harder for you not to do them because you've become so accustomed to, to doing them mm. and, and to introducing and including them as, as part of your day. Um, obviously, when you're in uh, a new country and you're in a new location and you've got a new baby and, and all this kind of stuff, thing, things become a lot more difficult. But regardless of that, it, it's trying to find certainty in that uncertainty and, and to try and find some, some calm amongst the, the chaos. So as much as I could, mm. I tried to replicate that as, as best as I could. So, you know, in an ideal world, yes, I can get up. Um, when, when the sun rises, I can have my coffee. I can spend a little bit of time kind of, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's doing a little bit of breathing, a little bit of meditation, just doing a little bit of showing some gratitude or whatever's part of that routine, right? So ideally you've got a certain amount of time. Realistically, when, when, when you've got a baby, that, that completely changes because you don't know when they're going to wake up for a start. You don't know how much sleep you're going to get in the night. So, it's finding the the best way to implement what you can. So rather than saying, I don't have half hour this morning to do all these things, it's how much time do I have? Okay, I've got five minutes. Okay, I'm going to take some time for myself to focus on myself for these five minutes just to just to find some, some calm, just to find some stillness um, and, mm-hmm. and think about you know, what you want to achieve, whether it's what we want to achieve for the day, whether it's just finding five minutes to have that cup of coffee away from all, all the chaos that's, that's unfolding around you. Um, just giving yourself that time, putting yourself into that space, because unless you put yourself in that space, you know, you can't, you can't think about the direction you go and you can't solve problems. You can't, um, make sure that you're heading to, to, to where you want to head. So it, it was basically a, a case of, trying my best to stick to those same patterns and in an ideal world when summer would sleep until seven i could get up at six and i could do all those things i could have a really good start of the day but when she wakes up at five and straight away you wake up and you're reactive right you don't get time to mm-hmm. do all that now you've got a you've got a baby that needs to be fed or that needs a nappy change or that now is like running around the room non-stop as soon as she wakes up <laughs> and demanding all of your attention okay so <laughs> As, as much as that previous routine, I'm, I'm trying slowly to kind of get back to it, you know, realistically, uh, things, things are different now, right? So it's a case of, it's a case of making the best that you can in the situation, but still being sure to create that time for yourself to focus on an element of those things. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice, mate. And, you know, I'm experiencing this myself, you know, I am quite structured disciplined when I'm at home um, in my own location my own environment I was in Russia for six weeks had a really solid routine there Um, you know settled in went straight into my my normal routine still waking up at six o'clock would go for a walk on the beach do some active meditation etc etc now I'm in Dubai I've been in Dubai for a week and like my whole circadian rhythm has changed because you know, obviously, I'm here with Peter Yarn. We're in fight camp right now. Um, he fights in a couple of weeks' time in Abu Dhabi. We're recording this on the 13th of October. Um, he fights on the 30th. We've been in Dubai for a week, and you know, our training times have changed. We were training in the morning at 10 o'clock, and then um, five o'clock in the afternoon. Now we're in Ab- uh, UAE. You know, he wants to train as close to his fight time as possible, which is likely going to be 11, 11:30 at night. Yeah. So, you know. Like the first week, man, that we were here, my circadian rhythm was like completely thrown out of whack. My routine was all over the place. And, you know, I didn't do any work. I didn't record any podcasts. I had you booked in. I had to cancel. Had a number of other guests booked in. I had to cancel because I just didn't know what the fuck was happening. Right. So again, you know, I've had to find that calm in the chaos, chaos, as you said. And I haven't had time to go through my morning routine. I haven't had be in a position to be able to do all the things that I know set me up for a really good day and put me on the front foot. But what I have been able to do is just take small pieces of each one of those elements. And, you know, if I, if I, if I'm up for an hour or two before I get that five minutes of meditation where I can find a quiet corner and create some stillness, then that's what I need to do, man. And it's been a completely different experience for me because, you know, I haven't, 
this is the first time I've been in an environment where I'm living with a heap of people. Like the seven dudes here, man. There's like four professional fighters, three coaches, including myself. We're all living in this this big apartment, so we're all on top of each other. And it's <laughs> been it's I've never I haven't been in this environment since I since I was in the army well, like ten years ago when I got out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, man. So you know, it's been it's been a crazy um, different experience for me, but. You know, the first week that we got here, we're going to the gym at like midday and then we'll train. We're in the gym at like eight o'clock at night. We weren't walking out until 10 o'clock at night. So then by the time we get home, we have a shower, have dinner, start winding down for the night. It's like 12, 30, one o'clock in the morning, man. And for me, I'm like, it's like completely thrown my circadian rhythm out of whack. But, you know, I've, I've had to adjust my schedule. I've had to adjust how I do things when I do my meditation, when I create that stillness um, wherever I can throughout the day, you know? So I think that's an important, um, aspect that people need to understand is like, it's not this all or nothing mindset where, well, I I can't get up at six o'clock and I can't be in bed by 10 o'clock at night where like, obviously that's my ideal situation, but that's just not the reality of how I'm living right now. So I need to make those adjustments and I need to find those things that are going to have the biggest impact on, on me and then go, where can I add these things in? And for me, you know, it is creating that five minutes of stillness through whether that's, you know, um, meditation on the balcony or whether that might be a walking meditation where I'm not listening to anything. I'm not, um, you know, distracting myself with what I need to do. I'm just kind of like letting my mind flow wherever it needs to go, man. Um, and that's a big one for me is being able to find that. Um, I, I'm actually reading, oh, sorry, I've just finished reading the book, uh, Stillness is a Key by Ryan Holiday. Great book. Um, I've read The Obstacle is the Way and Ego is the Enemy. Love the Stoic philosophy. Um, you're actually reading uh, The Daily Stoic at the moment. You had something on Instagram the other day and I hit you up and I was like, that looks like some Ryan Holiday stuff. Like, how important is reading for you? How has your um, routine changed and how do you implement, what are the most important things for you to do on a daily basis that do put you on the front foot? Yeah. So re- reading is quite a big one for me. Um, I've read, uh, yeah, I've read Obstacle is the Way, I've read Ego is the Enemy, but I haven't read uh, Stillness is the Key, so that's, that's next on the list. Um, but yeah, I, I read the Daily Stoic and the Daily Stoic is great because it, it's, it's basically, it's a page a day. Um, so there's, there's, there's a message, you know, it's based on Stoic philosophy. There's a message. It's a page, maybe a page and a half. It'll take you two minutes to read. So regardless of how much time you've got, you know, you should be able to find that time. Um, and then the idea is that you, you, you meditate on that or you think about that. And that's your message for the day. And that's what you try and you just plant that seed, right? Yeah. That, and you try and take action on, on, on that. Um, and you know, I do do a lot of reading and previously that probably would have been part of my morning routine but now I typically read before bed because I don't have mm-hmm. the time um, in the morning I get I get up and straight away I'm, I'm giving Summer her milk and I'm I'm chasing around and I'm getting the toys out and stuff and I try and I try and let Jess have a little bit of a of a lie-in in the morning um, while I set Summer up and then <clears throat> when Summer's ready for her breakfast uh, Jess kind of takes over and then I kind of get out and I, I'll start my morning routine. So my morning routine's a little bit kind of delayed from what it was, but I'm still trying to, uh, I'll definitely read a, a passage from the Daily Stoic, try and have my coffee, try and do maybe a little bit of visualization, uh, vi- visualization or just, just clear the mind for the day and, and kind of set me up and like you said, put you on the front foot for the day. And then I'll go in, then I'll go into my training. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the question was was about, about reading. Um, it, it, it's big for me. And it's, if you can't do it in the morning, do it in the evening. If you can't do it in the evening, do it on your commute to work. You know, if you can't, I haven't got the time to read, can you listen to an audio book? If, you, you know, if you're not into mm-hmm. audio books, listen to Sean's podcast. You know, just try and find <laughs> a way of, of consuming information and, and trying to develop that personal growth, that personal development. Most of what I read is geared around... Um, personal development um, or, or sports um, or, or, or training, fitness and, and nutrition. I'm not really into into novels, um, but that, that's me personally. If, if you can read a novel and it gets you out of your, you know, your, your daily space and it takes you to, to another place and you come back and you kind of feel kind of feel refreshed and then, 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 you know, that's great for you. Mm, yeah, that's great advice, mate. You know, everyone's going to be different. You know, I, 
I'm the same as you. I like reading nonfiction um, and that personal growth, personal development stuff. Um, and for me, that, that really works. That helps me wind down um, at night. Sometimes I read in the morning. Sometimes I read at night. Sometimes I read during the day. Like I just I f- find time to do that and I create space to, to get that reading in. It is very important for me now. <clears throat> Speaking about winding down, I've actually had, uh, it's, it's kind of comical how many questions I get regarding recovery protocols. And for me, like there's so many different recovery protocols and, you know, how do you put them together? What's the most important thing for you? Like, I'm sure you're going to be different to me. Um, I'm going to be different to someone else, but how would you... The reason I ask this is because on Sunday we went out to um, the marina, got a yacht, cruised around, we had an awesome you. day with we the boys, you. awesome recovery session, man. You know, we got out, got some sunshine, got some fresh air, got some salt water, ate some like really good foods um, and just kind of hung out and relaxed. And, you know, for me, that's an awesome recovery day, but there's so many different recovery mechanisms. What does a recovery day look like for you? That's the question I've been getting. If, if I'm going to have a recovery day, what, does, what should that look like? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. actually, I'll, I'll get you to go first before I speak. Yeah, I saw, I saw you boys out on the board. Looks like you, you had, a, had a really good time. I actually responded to, to one of your stories. Um, and I imagine for them, right, that was, that was so refreshing to take them out of that environment where they're living and breathing the next fight that's coming up in a couple of weeks is the ultra focused, super focused on mm-hmm. the training and the goal and, and the fight, just completely switching that off and just getting out on a boat and, and, and enjoying themselves and, and somersaulting off the, off, off the boat <laughs> and, and all the rest of it. So slightly different for me, obviously you're, you're working with uh, elite athletes. So the recovery protocols that, that you're using um, maybe for yourself and, and for them as well, would typically be a little bit different than, than what, my situation is and also what I try and get my clients to do. Um, so, you know, with, with recovery, we need, we need to recover from the training, but we also need to recover from, from life as well, right? So mm-hmm. when we're training in the gym where, you know, we're breaking down the body, we're creating the stimulus. When we're recovering, that's, that's the, the growth and the repair. But a lot of people, you know, they, they've got they've got it completely wrong they think when they're not training or they're not in the gym that that's a bad thing they want they think that the growth occurs when they're when they're training so they want to do more training so it's trying to get people to they understand. think they're going to lose their gains yeah yeah they're going to lose my gains if i don't train for a week yeah so, i used to be the same bro yeah me too man me too so it's it's trying to get them to understand that no your body needs that recovery okay for the, for the strength gains to occur for the physical adaptations to occur that happens when you're recovering um so for for me it's like I'll always take sunday off I won't do any work I won't do any training um and and, and typically I'll I'll try and just switch off I mean fortunately now we're back in Phuket so it's a lot easier um, it's a lot easier to kind of get down to the beach. It's a lot easier to go and have a swim. It's a lot easier to go and find yourself a hammock and, and, and just chill out. And, and, and for me, that's, that's restorative. The, 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 the benefit that I get from sitting there in a hammock and watching the sunset is, is, is massive. Okay. Again, like, like I said, not just from a physical perspective, from, from the mental aspect as well. Um, and with a lot of my clients, it's getting them to understand that they need, to recover from from the training they need to recover from life like i said people have got jobs people have got families sometimes if you're pushing it too hard to get the training in it's actually having an adverse effect it's having a counterproductive Mm -hmm. effect you're better off kind of going home having having a good sleep and and getting an early night than maybe getting to the gym at half past eight nine o'clock and and trying to squeeze that workout in so it's just trying to help help guys uh, kind of change the mindset, change the thinking on that, and then trying to help them find ways to implement some recovery into their typically their weekends. You know, you know, typically most people are working on the Monday to Friday. So I, for myself, I'll use Sunday, and for most of my clients, I'll try and get them to do this over the weekend. And it's not it's not necessarily things like you know cold exposure and heat, heat exposure and the cryo chamber and all these types of things. It's it's just maybe getting out in the nature, you know. Maybe taking the dog out for the walk for a walk. Maybe taking the t- taking the kids out for a walk or a, or a hike or getting out with a family. So you know, finding ways of of recovering, of, of 
de-stressing of of nourishing the the body with nature which all has a has a massive impact on your recovery like you said not only in in training but in life as well Mm. yeah that's a great point mate and you know the, the the people that ask me these questions on like how should a recovery day look my answer is like it depends <laughs> as with everything it's like go for a massage you know go and do some yoga some yin style yoga go and get into nature and do some breath work switch your fucking phone off for yeah. three hours you know read a book get in the sea get some sun you know hang out with friends um you know, hot, cold therapy, go yeah. and whatever, man. Like pe- pe- everyone's pe- going to be completely looking, different. Go pe- out on a yacht. <laughs> yeah. But people are looking for the hack, right? They're looking, what, what's, what's, yeah. the, what's the hack? What, what's the latest kind of fads, the recovery tool, but they're not, they're not looking at the low, the low hanging fruit. Yeah. I think the big point that you made there that ties in all of those things that those, those recovery mechanisms, mechanisms I just spoke about is de-stress. Right, you live this stressful life where you know you've got appointments, you've got meetings, you've got conversations to have, you've got to pay bills, um, you know, you've got relationship issues, kids are playing up, blah 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 blah. You know, like you've got training on top of that. Then you know we need to find, we need to create. I've spoken, I've said this numerous times this episode, but we need to create that stillness to de-stress because you know all of those things are tied together by driving the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our relaxed state, right? So it doesn't matter what that tool is, as long as you can bring down the tone of the sympathetic state, that fight or flight state, that low level chronic fight or flight state that people typically find themselves in on a day-to-day basis, week to week, month to month, you know, if we can start reducing that and upregulating the parasympathetic nervous system and drive that relaxed response where we're telling ourselves, hey, we're in a safe environment, we, we need to decrease muscle tone, we need to decrease heart rate, respiratory rate, we need to, you know, we're essentially telling our body that we're in a safe space and we can relax, we can calm down. I think, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you're focusing on your breathing, you're doing going through that relax or driving that relaxed state, then you're going to get the benefit from the recovery. And as you said, that's when adaptation occurs. We when we train, we drive stimulus, and then we recover back to baseline homeostasis. And then it's only then can we then adapt above and beyond, we get bigger, stronger, faster, able to run for longer, etc. Yeah, man, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, it, it's, yeah, like you said, it's people, a lot of people actually would, would benefit more from having a massage or doing some yoga rather than trying to, trying to force themselves into the gym. They've had a, a crazy week at work, you know, maybe you've been working late, maybe you've been trying to work to a deadline. You've got lots going on, lots going on with the family. You, you get to the weekend and you try and, again, you're trying to think, right, I need to force a workout. I need to go and lift some heavy weights. So I need to go and smash myself into the floor to make myself feel good. Um, but again, it's, it's creating that, you know, the parasympathetic response, what, what we need to do is to calm down, to put ourselves into that rest or, or digest state. And, and that's actually going to help us create adapt- adaptations rather than, than kind of beating ourselves up and, and smashing at ourselves. That's a great point, mate. You know, like if, if, if people do miss out on a workout throughout the week, then they, because they have been stressed, they've been overworked, blah, blah, blah. And they think, fuck, I need to catch up on that workout. And then they go and hammer themselves. They're just adding stress on top yeah. of stress. Yeah, man, that's brilliant. Now, I, I spoke about my blood pressure, waking heart rate, heart rate variability earlier, but just to start rounding up out this episode, I want to give people some actionable advice that they can take. And I, I put this post out on Instagram uh, a couple of weeks ago. And basically what I was saying was, you know, a very simple way of um, seeing how much stress your body's under is by taking your waking heart rate every morning. Now, if you don't have a Fitbit or some form of activity tracker that does that for you, then what you can do is just use the your carotid artery um, or the radial artery where you just you know place your finger on the pulse and you count how many times your heart beats in a one minute period or you can reduce that and go count for 30 seconds multiply that by two count for 15 seconds multiply that by four and what people will find is you know once you get your baseline say my baseline heart rate waking heart rate is 50 beats per minute you know if i've had a couple of Last week, for example, my routine was all over the place. I wasn't getting to bed until 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. 
waking up, whenever I wake up, you know, all over the place, you know, my waking heart rate went from 50, 50 odd beats per minute up to like 58 beats per minute, man, over the course of the week. So that's an indication that, you know, my body's under a heap of stress. So then going and training really fucking hard on top of that, it's just adding stress on top of stress. So when my waking heart rate has progressively bounced up eight points, there's eight beats per minute that my heart is having to work harder. That adds up over an hour, that adds up over a day, that adds up over a week. So adding stress on top of stress, not ideal. So that's where maybe my training is going to change. I'm still going to train. I'm still going to get into the gym. But now, instead of getting after that heavy strength, speed, power session, now I'm going to back that off. I'm going to do some mobility work. You know, Maybe I'll do a little bit of like bodybuilding style, functional bodybuilding style training where it's nowhere near as neurologically demanding and it's more about that muscle pump. And then I'm going to finish off with some stretches, some um, breath work so that I can really drive that parasympathetic state and start calming everything back down. Once my heart rate comes back down, levels out, 50 beats per minute, all right, cool. Now I'm in a good place to be able to now add stress through training. Yeah. Yeah, such a good thing to track uh, your, your resting heart rate and your, your waking heart rate. Um, I've got I've got the Garmin myself, so that that's something I track as well. And it's patterns that that you pick up, right? You can see times that you've been traveling, times that your your body clock's trying to adjust, times that maybe you've 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 got a little bit sick, times that maybe you've started to overtrain a little bit. Um, and it's, it's mm-hmm. something that I kind of check in with with my clients as well. If, if my clients do have wearables, that's kind of built into to my um, to my app, so I can pretty much. You know, we can we can graph that out, and we can we can pick up patterns over time. Um, and I'll, I I can typically I can check in, and I can I can send somebody a message and say I know exactly how they're feeling today because their heart rate's gone up to like sixty eight, where it's typically down at like fifty eight or sixty. You know, so mm-hmm. um, and again, you know, using the tools that we have available. Like you said, if you don't have a wearable, there's ways of, of taking your pulse, but. Including that as, as a, a habit and an actionable step to actually say, hold on, how is my body responding today? And, and using that information to then decide how your training is going to look like. Yeah, that's fucking awesome, man. I think that's great advice to start winding the episode up on. Um, mate, if people want to get in contact with you, if they want to follow you, where can they find you? Uh, my website is www.kis-fitness.com. Keep it simple. And I'm on Instagram at, at the dot Rob Morgan. Love it, mate. I'll have all of those links in the show notes. Rob, as always, brother, appreciate it. I appreciate you, mate. Thank you for coming on the episode. Awesome, Sean. Cheers, bro. This episode was brought to you by Swiss 8, which is a proactive mental health program designed by veterans, initially for veterans, that has been pushed out to the wider community that allows you to structure in and schedule their eight pillars of health and wellness, including nutrition, sleep, uh, time management, discipline, fitness, personal growth, mindfulness, and minimalism. This episode was also brought to you by Be Spunky, which is a male hormone optimization supplement that I've been taking for about a year and a half, and I absolutely rate. It is a TGA-listed nutraceutical, meaning that it's made from all organic produce, Uh, to help you manage and optimize your stress levels, which in turn increases your ability to improve testosterone production levels naturally. Uh, Use the code COBES10 at checkout for your 10% discount. All of those links will be in the show notes. If you got some benefit from this episode, please make sure you pass it off to your friends and family. Uh, I'd appreciate any shares on social media platforms. If you tag me or if you share it to your stories, make sure you tag me so I can share that as well. Any five-star ratings and reviews are much appreciated. Much love, guys. Peace.